Well, we're now really on the backside of this assignment thing, and guess what? This is not an assignment message. <laughs> uh, we spent the holidays over on the East Coast, of course, with our uh, kids and with our grandkids and with our East Coast campus, Redemption in Greenville. And uh, for those of you watching around the world by TV, those of you on our social media sites, and, and also those sitting under the roof of one of our campuses, uh, this is one of those times where to get everybody back on the same page, which we try to keep continuity. We try to make sure everybody's hearing the same thing, that I have to come up and I get to do about five or six of these a year, and they're called throwbacks. And uh, in these throwbacks, it's me going back and laying foundations that need to be laid. Uh, to the faith, there are foundations. You cannot build upon faulty foundations. If you start putting a lot of weight on faulty foundations or on cracked foundations, the crack will begin to split and the whole building will fall. And I think a lot of times right now, we've got a whole generation of people trying to learn other things and they have never had the foundations of their faith uh, made really solid so that it can hold a lot of spiritual weight, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> and a lot of spiritual maturity. So uh, we're going to be finishing up in about two more weeks, all of assignment part one and all of assignment part two. And then we're going to enjoy our holiday uh, services together. And then the first of the year, I'm going to do a whole new praise and worship series, the likes of which you have never heard. We're going deep, guys. So anyway, open your Bible with me to Malachi chapter one. Open your phone, your iPad, your computer, your Bible app, however you get there. It does not matter to me, but I want, I want your Bible open because I want you to have a relationship with your Bible. Uh, I want you to have a relationship with a Bible when your uh, child has a fevered brow and there's no service and there's no scriptures on the screen and I'm not telling you what God says. I want you to have a relationship with your Bible so you can know exactly what God says and you can know exactly what to do when there's no preacher and no praise team there to help you do it. Malachi chapter one, got several others I'll read in a moment, about four more scriptures, but I want to read, a number, I know a lot of you are like, oh no, Malachi, because that's the tithing scripture. I didn't say Malachi 3. That's chapter 3. Malachi chapter 1. Nobody talks about that one. Nobody reads that one. But there's some powerful things that are foundational to our faith, not just the tithing in chapter 3. There's something in chapter 1, and I want to read that. Read with me, please, right now. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father... Where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts. To you priests, now he's talking to the preachers. To you preachers who despise my name. Yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? You offer defiled food on my altar, but you say, in what way have we defiled you? Next verse, please. By saying the table of the Lord is contemptible and you offer the blind as a sacrifice, talking about the animal sacrifices. They're going and they're getting the sick, the worst of the animals and bringing it as a sacrifice unto God. Is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer this to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Next verse, please. Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? Now look at right here. He says, entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us. He said, let me tell you what you're going to have to do to get back in the graces of God, get back in the favor of God. He said, because what you have been doing is contemptible. He says, entreat now the Lord's favor that he may be gracious to us while this is being done by your hands. Verse 10, will he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? Who is there among you who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you. Verse 11 says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hand from the rising of the sun. Woo, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same in the King James or even to its going down in you, King James. My name shall be great 
among the Gentiles. And every place incense shall be offered by my name. Lord, bless the reading of your word in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. All right, at this church, we talk to each other. So look at your person on the right and on the left and say, here we go, neighbor. Here we go, here we go. Guys, I'm gonna tell you, I'm about to just let this thing go. Wave at me if you wanna hear everything I got. Okay, I just wanna make sure. I want, because this right here, this is a ch- Kingdom dynamics, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the keys of the kingdom, kingdom laws, kingdom principles, however you want to label it, they cannot function outside of this atmosphere. They cannot function outside of this culture. That presents us in 2023 with a great problem because we are now in an American culture which honors and respects nothing. We don't respect anybody. We don't respect anything. And if we find a flaw in anyone, it's not a place where we want to minister. It's a place where we want to take it and use it against them. That's why nobody wants to let anybody close because when you get close to me, you're going to see what I don't do well and I don't trust that you're going to take that information to be a blessing to me. I'm fearful that you're going to take that information and somehow harm me with it because the culture of the kingdom is honor. Honor means, you know, I I used to tell them in the marriage conference, honor is, you know, when you honor your wife, you never lose your, we honor is how a marriage functions. Honor is how a parent functions to their children. Honor is how he's a husband to the wife. Honor is how she is the light of his day. It's all about honor. And here is the enemy of honor. The enemy of honor is familiarity. Because when you see a person time after time and day after day and you see them outside of what they do well and outside of their gift, outside of their skill set, outside of what they bring to the table, when you see the negatives in their life, when you see what the treasure in the field, you see the field in their life, when you see the dirty things in their life, then all of a sudden we get disappointed and we lose our honor and we get familiar. This is not biblical, but they say familiarity breeds contempt. And there is truth to that. What does it mean? It means when I find the part of you that I don't like, it causes me to no longer honor you. So now we have marriages with no honor. And that is the deterioration of the marriage. We have kids that don't respect their parents. That is the deterioration of parenthood. We have now people standing in pulpits like myself who they're made fun of and they're mocked all the time and they make videos and they make mockery of them and they make light of them. And now we have guys that are powerless in pulpits because nobody honors them or the gift or the anointing of God on their life. And when you see honor go out the door, all of a sudden kingdom dynamics go out the door with it. The kingdom cannot function without a culture of honor being in a building. I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of a people that can show the rest of the church and the rest of the world what honor looks like. I want to know, I want to show them what it looks like to honor and to fear God. I want to show them what it looks like to honor and what it means to reverence those who are in authority over you, to reverence and respect those who hold office, to reverence and respect those that are in uniform, to reverence and respect. Come on, somebody to reverence and honor our wives in our homes and the way guys talk about girls and the way girls respond to guys. Somehow honor has got to be infused and you can't just talk about it. There's got to be a people that model it. Somebody raise your hand and wave at me. If you say, I want to model it in my home. I want to model it in my workplace. I want to model it when I'm on the streets. I want to model it when I'm in the marketplace. I want to model it when I'm in my church. I want to model it when I'm among the different races and different cultures than me because honor is not something you give when they deserve it honor is not objective it is subjective it is not necessarily their standard honor is your standard and God will demand 
that you honor the unhonorable. God will demand that you respect that which is not respectable. Why? Because when you honor them, you pull something different out of them. I'm preaching right now. When you respect them, you pull something different from out from them than anybody else does. And this has got to be the culture of redemption and everything that is in your house. Why? Because I want the kingdom to come and I want his will to be done. Somebody take five seconds and shout hallelujah in this place. Come on, shout hallelujah. Woo. Woo. I have a couple of people on each side and say honor, 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 honor. Honor, I feel something happening. I feel something stirring in this place. I feel something moving. I feel a culture being created. I feel something in the atmosphere. Lord, we honor your presence in our praise. We honor your presence in our worship. We honor God in tithe and offering, as the Lord says, with our substance. We honor, we honor, we honor. And then let your kingdom come in the midst of that honor and let your will be done. Say amen. I got to go on. I got to go. I'm going to lay out some principles. Those of you that have been with Redemption 15, 20, 30 years, you've heard them before, but probably haven't heard them in a long time. <laughs> but a lot of Redemption now, and especially East and those virtual are new to this, and I want to Relay some foundations. Number one, you receive someone on the exact same level that you perceive them. You receive someone on the same level that you perceive them. So perception is not about them. Perception is something that is a filter inside of you. It is how you see a thing. Perspective. It's not exactly maybe what they are. It's how you perceive them. Help me. Jesus was with the woman at the well. I go back to this many times because it's the most blatant example of this principle. He could get nowhere with her. In fact, she would just kind of, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, back and forth. Uh, well, could I have something to drink? Uh, the well is deep. You have nothing to draw with. Basically, you, Jew, you Jews don't even have anything to do with us Samaritans till you need anything. Well, if you knew who was talking to you, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Well, I wish you would give me this whatever water you got so I ain't got to keep going. He just wasn't getting anywhere. Then he shifts her perception. He says, go call your husband. He moves outside of his humanity and shifts into his deity. And she said, well, I, I, uh, I don't have one. He said, you're right. You've had five. The one you're with now is not your husband. She said, sir, I perceive thou art a prophet. Then he continued to prophesy to her. He could not prophesy to her until she perceived him as being that. He was prophesying, though, if you knew who he was talking to, you'd ask him for living water. And you'd never, th he was prophesying to her, but she couldn't receive it because she did not perceive him as a prophet. When he shifted her perception, all of a sudden the gift that was in him, thank you, Holy Ghost, the gift that was in him was able to flow and it was able to bless her and benefit her life. That's where I'm going today. When, you, when your standard is the standard of honor, no matter how they act or what they do, you're going to honor them. Then what that means is the thing inside of them that God placed in them to bless you, you now have access to that thing. Hallelujah. Man, this is good stuff. Wish somebody had told me this 30 years ago. You now have access to it. But I cannot have access to the treasure inside of you if I do not activate the culture of the kingdom, which is honor, because honor activates your treasure and allows your treasure to come to the surface. And that's how you can become a blessing to me. Jesus could do nothing, and she said, I perceive thou art a prophet. It wasn't that he wasn't a prophet before. He was a prophet.
prophet the whole time, but she didn't see him as a prophet. So many times we have lost so many blessings because God has brought somebody into our midst, but we did not see them properly and we did not perceive them properly. And we were waiting for Jesus himself to show up, but you didn't know when you were praying, God was going to let John show up. And God, you, you didn't know God was going to let Sarah show up. And just like God told Israel, he said, I have heard your cry. I have seen your afflictions. I know your sorrows and I have come down to deliver you. Listen to what he says. I have come down to deliver you. Then he says, come here, Moses. And they're like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You said you were coming. We don't want Moses. We know Moses. Moses has been running from the law for 40 years. See, they know the humanity of Moses, but they don't know the God deliverer in Moses. And now God is sending Moses and they didn't respect him at first, but God was with him and God did signs and wonders and it began to shift Moses' perception in the eyes of the people and then even in the eyes of Pharaoh and then miracle after miracle after miracle happened. It doesn't mean that Pharaoh, that Moses wasn't God's man the whole time. It just means that it wasn't activated until honor was given to the man of God. Matthew 10, 41 and 42. He who receives, say receive. Okay. You are received like you are perceived. Let me get back to that. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet. In other words, he who receives a prophet and sees him correctly shall receive a prophet's reward. <laughs> if I see this person as a prophet of God, then I receive them as a prophet of God. I will get from them what God sent through them for me to have. I know y'all want me to scream, but I got to settle down and make sure you're getting these things. These are powerful principles. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet receives a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives these little ones a cup of cold water in my name, uh, cold water in the name of a disciple, surely I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. In other words, Jesus lays out a principle. He says, if you see them right and you receive them right, then you will get from them what I put in them for you to receive. I have no ability to help you if you have no honor for me. If you sit at the table and your whole family, that Ron Carpenter, he ain't nothing but a just blown. Okay, nobody from your family is going to ever be able to benefit from the anointing on my life. Is it because I deserve honor? Absolutely not. I don't deserve anything. But God has put stuff in me and God has put stuff on me and it's not for me, it's to benefit you. So now he places the burden on you to see me correctly and to receive me correctly so that what he's put on me may benefit your life and your household in a positive way. You can't benefit from anyone you disrespect. Honor has to be the culture. That activates the kingdom. Look to about people behind you, in front of you, beside you, and say, I don't know, but he's, it seems like he's talking straight to you. I, I think he's talking to you. Look, come on, say it. I think, I think he's talking to you right now. Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. I'm going back to Malachi. I'm putting all, all this is in the middle. I'm, Malachi is where I'm going to land. <clears throat> Then Jesus went out from there and came to his own country. His disciples followed him. <clears throat> when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. 
And many hearing him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this in which has been given to him that such are performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter? The son of Mary, the brother of James, Hoseas, Judas, and Simon? And are these not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. And Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his relatives, and in his own house. He could do no mighty work there except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled at their unbelief. Then he went about to the villages in a circuit preaching. He went in there and he got out. Now, what is happening here? I have always said that if there was ever a time I wanted to score a touchdown, it was in front of my home crowd. If there's ever a time I wanted to be the high scorer, I wanted to be with my dad and my mom sitting in the stands. <clears throat> if there's ever a time I wanted to knock one out of the ballpark, it was when my family had come to the game and we were watching and we were all going to go grill out afterwards. At no time did I want to do it more than I did with my home crowd. Okay? I do not think Jesus had any selfish ambition in him. But I do believe he had great love for his earthly family and earthly relatives. And I'm sure that he, just like he cleaned out hospitals in every other town, he would that and all the more like to bring that same anointing and that same miracle working power to people that he knew that grew up with, that he grew up with and that had made an investment in his life. The only problem was it was not the place of honor. It was the only place he did not have honor. When I go in to speak at other churches, let me tell you what I get the microphone and do. I don't get the microphone and start selling stuff. I don't get the microphone and tell them about my book or tell them about the vault. I don't get it and just start preaching. I stop because most of the time they stand up and they clap. And if I've been there before and if they enjoyed it, sometimes they clap loud. If they didn't enjoy it, sometimes they don't clap much at all. But they stand up and they honor me. And I take the mic and I say, remain standing, please. And when I look at them and say, remain standing, why do I say that? I say, remain standing. I said, because I've never understood why the guy who's going to come and leave gets a standing ovation. In other words, gets honor. But the people sitting on the front row who come to stay and they've been here 10 years, they've been here 20 years, they've been here 30 years, they're going to be there to answer the phone, they're going to be in the office, they're going to be grinding it out, they're going to be filling out the organizational flow chart, they're going to be studying messages, they're going to be discipling, they're going to be at the hospital, they're going to be there to pastor you, they're going to pray with you at the altar. The guy who came to stay never gets a clap. But the guy who comes and goes gets one. That was what Jesus was ha had happening to him in his hometown. The towns that had no point of reference with him, he was Messiah and Messiah only. But when he went back to his hometown, he was Messiah, but he was also Jesus the carpenter's son. And so now the people have a dilemma. They get to choose, what will I draw out of him? Will I draw his humanity out of him or will I draw his deity out of him? And Jesus began to flow in might and wonder and in words of wisdom and they were offended saying, who does he think he is? Is this not Mary's boy? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is this not James and Hosea's and, and, and all the rest? Is this not their brother and John? Is this not their brother? And they were offended at him. Offended because they knew him in his humanity that he would try to operate in anything else. It is amazing to me how the very people that we need support from will not give it to you because they know too much about you. And you can walk in any place and tell them, say, I'm going to do this one day. And they'll encourage you, but you can go back home 
and you can sit among relatives amongst people who knew you. When I went back to my high school friends from college and announced to them that I had given my heart to Jesus and I was going into full-time ministry, the laughter and the mockery that broke out broke my heart. Why? Because they knew everything about my humanity. They never could see me walking with the gift of God on my life. And to this day, I have no ability to bless them and I've never had any ability to bless them because I'm still high school run, but they never saw the anointed man of God that God raised me up and put something in me that could change people's lives. They don't see that, so I don't have the ability to bless them. I'm asking you right now, who is God sending you that you have not honored? Is there people in your house that you've not honored? Is there a great David that is out there with the sheep that's being disrespected, but he's got the oil of God on his life? Who is it in your house that God wants to favor, but they did everything and you know all their story. I don't know, but there's somebody in your house. There's somebody in your circle and don't let your disrespect rob you of the opportunity to draw a miracle out of them. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet gets a prophet's reward. Somebody lift your hands for 15 seconds and shout hallelujah. Oh, I want to be an honoring church. Shout hallelujah. I want to be a church with a culture of honor. Somebody say amen. I got to move on. I got to move on. <laughs> Luke 10, 38. Luke 10, 38. Ooh, I got to hurry up. Now what happened as they went, they entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she called, excuse me, and she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Martha was distracted with much serving as she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus said to her, Martha, Martha, you are troubled about many things, verse 42, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen the good part, which will not be taken away from her. I like the King James there actually a little bit better. Stay with me. Because it actually says the greater portion. Mary has chosen the greater portion. Powerful. I'm trying to prove this, this point of honor and for honor to be something that is subjective inside of you. It is the filter through which you have your perceptions. It is the standard by which you function. You don't honor when they become honorable. You honor because it's your standard, not theirs. Mary has chosen the greater portion. When Jesus walked into that house... Jesus was not 50% God and 50% man. He was 100% God and 100% man. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He's John chapter 1 and verse 12 through 14. The word become flesh. Jesus walks into the house. There's his humanity and there's his deity. Martha, if you would just allow me a little bit of Leeway with the scripture here is fluffing the pillows. She's dusting off the end tables. She's got the food in there cooking and she's stirring the pot. And she's making sure the humanity of Jesus is comfortable. Mary is sitting postured in worship. Hanging on every word that comes out of his mouth. Mary is ministering to his deity. Martha is ministering to his humanity. Mary is ministering to his deity. And Jesus did not say that her acts of service weren't important. He said that worship was greater. Mary has chosen the greater part. There were two parts of me for you to recognize or receive. Martha received the humanity of the Lord. Mary received the divinity of the Lord. 
and Mary chose the greater portion. If you receive the Messiah in the name of the Messiah, you will receive the Messiah's reward. She saw Jesus, the carpenter's son. Mary saw Jesus, the son of God. When someone walks into your midst, you don't know the gift on their life. But God will demand that you honor them so that the gift can then turn around and benefit you, receives a prophet's reward. Back to Malachi. Go to verse, go to verse 10. Malachi 1 verse 10. And I'm going to close. He's talking to the priests. The priests have been not offering the spotless lambs. They've been offering the ones nobody wants. They've been offering the ones that are going to sick and die anyway. They have become familiar with the Lord. They have become familiar with their sacrifices. They've become familiar with their worship. They've become familiar with the house of God, and God has had it. And God is saying, who is there among you that would shut the doors and not kindle fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you. He's saying, if this stuff don't mean anything to you, why should it mean anything to me? He said, if you are bringing stuff to me that you don't care about and all that I am getting is your leftovers, he said, if I am a father, where is my honor? He said, and your local officials, your governors would not even be pleased with what you're doing. And you're going to bring this to your covenant God? <laughs> he said, you're not bringing me the first fruits of your increase. You're not bringing me your tithe. You're bringing me your leftovers. You're not bringing me the <laughs> spotless lambs. You're bringing me the sick lambs. He said, you can't even do this to local officials, but yet you're going to bring this to the living God who brought you out of Egypt with a mighty hand and who pulled down the walls of Jericho and made you a city set on a hill and a light unto the nations. You're going to treat that God this way? He said, shut the doors. He said, if I mean no more to you than that, cut off the lights, cut off the sound system, get rid of the musicians, wipe off the stage, cut off the air, shut the doors, shut the thing down. He said, because if it means nothing to you, it means nothing to me. Where is the honor in my worship? When we worship, it is not the time to be getting a pack of gum. When we worship, it's not the time to be counting the ceiling lights. It is the time where we passionately come into the presence of God and offer him a sacrifice of praise. When we praise, it does not matter what kind of week I've had. It does not matter how I feel or what I'm going through. God is worthy to be praised. And he says, if if you're coming in here and you don't care about the worship, I don't care about it. If you're coming in here going through the motions, I'm going to go through the motions. That's why the Bible says, whatsoever things you desire, believe that you have received when you say them and you shall have them. It don't start with saying it. It don't start with believing it. It don't start with receiving it. It starts with desire. Do you want it? He said, and if you want it, and if it makes you pray, and if it keeps you up at night, and if you walk around barefooted praying in the Holy ghost in your kitchen because you want it he said then believe you have received it and you shall have it somebody say amen go to verse go to verse 11 please ah, hallelujah from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same my name shall be great He said, my plan is for the nations to watch how you love me and say, I don't know their God, but the way they love him, he must be a great God. 
When they see, when somebody sees your praise, do they look and say, I don't know the God they're praising, but by the way they're jumping and spinning and sweat running down their face, they must have a great God. When people see your worship, do they see such passion exuding from you? Are you standing out there just still and watching, waiting to be entertained? Or are you giving God a sacrifice of praise? Can people see your worship and say, I don't know the God they're worshiping, but he must be a great God. When it's time for the tithe and offering, is it time for you to take a rest or a potty break? Or is that a time where you're bringing the first fruits, the tithe of your increase unto God? And they look at your giving and say, I don't know the God they're giving to, but he must be a great God. When they see you serving in the house of God and see the diligence with which you love people and pray for people and welcome people and minister to their kids, they need to look at your service and say, I don't know the God they're serving, but by looking at their service, he must be a great God. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord shall be praised. Somebody take 10 seconds and praise him. Five, four, three, two, one. Shout hallelujah. Honor. Marriages die because of honor. When it leaves, things deteriorate. The lack of honor causes families to implode. The lack of honor causes success to erode. Familiarity causes the business to stall. Familiarity causes us across the hallway not to pull the best out of our brother and out of our sister. Familiarity in the house of God causes the miracles to stop and the anointing to quit flowing. It causes the praise to be stale and it causes the worship to be impotent. And God says, if you're going to work like that, then shut the doors. I have no pleasure in it. I want to segue. I want Pastor to come up. But I'm, I'm going to keep the altar call right now. I usually pass it off, but I'm going to keep it. Since we're laying old foundations, let me retreat to a very familiar story that I love. And whenever I feel my honor and my passion and my emotion leaving my relationship with God and it becoming duty and oriented and work oriented, I go back to this. (laughs) Elisha was building a school for the prophets and there was one that was chopping a piece of wood and when he swung the axe head flew off and fell into the water and he was very concerned because not only did he lose the axe head but the axe was borrowed it was not his he ran to Elisha the prophet and said the axe head is gone he said he said take me to where you lost it He took him back to where he lost it, pointed to that area. He took a stick and threw it in that area of the water and the axe head floated. (laughs) What is the story? What's the analogy I'm trying to bring? See, if I take a tree and I no longer have the sharpened axe head, then I'm wailing away at it with just the stick. What makes the axe efficient? and successful, the sharpened edge. What did the man lose? He lost his edge. You're low on honor, you're low on passion. You're going through the motions. Let me ask you this, where did you lose it? Take God to where you lost it today. Did you lose it when you got the divorce? Did you lose it during COVID? Nah, just kind of casual with God and, ah, yeah, we really, 
<clears throat> we don't go to church that much no more. We just kind of like being in our pajamas. Where did you lose it? When did you stop giving to the Lord? Yeah, you know, we've been hurt in church. I just kind of want to sit on the back row. I don't want to get involved. Where did you lose it? Who offended you? Where did you lose it? When did you get hurt? When did you, when did you get mad? <laughs> right now, if you feel like you're at a place in your relationship with God where you have lost these precious elements of honor, and you don't sense it in your worship. You don't sense it in your praise. And the people around you are jumping and dancing, but you feel somewhat numb. And you do what you do, and you're diligent, but you do it with a lack of passion. <clears throat> and you no longer get the fulfillment from it that you once did. You've lost it. But losing it is not a terminal illness. The man of God says, take me to where you lost I want you right now. Don't think about it. Don't reason it. Don't wait for eight other people to go and then I'll go. I want you to get out of your seat right now and I want you to come to this altar. If you say, I'm going through the motions, I feel numb inside and I'm going to be honest with you, I've not sensed the presence of God in so long and that honor you're talking about that God deserves, I want to recapture it today. I need the axe head to float on top of the water. If that's you, get down here, get down here. Come on, don't, don't waste time. Don't just walk down here. I need you to get down here. I need you to get down here. I need you to get down here. Men, women, boy, girl, maybe marriage, maybe couples holding hands. I don't know. You need to get down here. If it's left your marriage, if it's left your home, if it's left your relationship with God, maybe you have no excitement or passion about anything. Get out of your seat. Get out of that row and get down here right now. Pastor, if you would just take it right now and minister, minister in the power of the Spirit of God. What an incredible day. Listen, Pastor gave some instructions, so no matter where you are, let's stop. Let's honor this moment. Let's really go after God. If you're driving, pull over. If you're at the office, shut the door. If you're at home, lift your hands. Get in a posture to receive from God today. Let's be honest. Let's pour out our hearts. Let's be transparent. Let's get our hearts right so that we can walk into everything that He has planned for us, okay? Listen, our prayer line is open right now. We've got a live team ready to agree to pray with you. Click that prayer button. iChurch, we love you. We're so glad God connected you with us, and we are believing for the best week ever. Amen. Be blessed.